you now to please pray for me as I pray for you. Let us pray. Holy and living God, may your truth be known this day and forever. O oh Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I have felt the spirit moving in our church these past couple weeks. Anybody else? Anybody else feel this energy we've got? We've been sharing our stories and praying together, and a lot of us have been joining to read through our study book for Lent, Unbinding Your Heart. Now, if you're our guest today, or if you haven't been here in a while, you've come into a church that is on an exciting adventure with God. We're spending six weeks together inviting God to change us and guide us. If you want to join us, you're more than welcome. Anyone can join in at any time. Our first week we had 24 people come to a, a meeting group, and this past week we had 26. So let's keep up the growing. In the last two weeks of our sermon series, we've acknowledged some hard truths. We faced the clear and dire need in our world for Christians everywhere to do authentic and intentional evangelism. The church is declining. And we faced the hard truth that we have a real reluctance and discomfort towards doing evangelism. Now, the scriptures we read today tell us of the hard truths that Jesus brought to others to the money changers in the temple, and the hard truth that faced Saul on the road to Damascus. In both stories, though, Jesus made a way forward for them, out of their sin. And thankfully, Jesus makes a way for us, too. Now, it's pretty clear. We church people know how to work hard, right? We're masters at hard work. I don't know how many times I've heard Ken Jones say, this church is full of hard workers. And it's true. We do free dinners every month. We host rummage sales and chicken barbecues, and we've made over 5,000 dresses. Almost 6,000 now, right? It's over six. Over 6,000 dresses. I'm out of date already. Surely, churches aren't shrinking because we're lazy. Christians have been working hard for a really long time. But we too have been led astray by profits and wealth and success like the money changers. And Christians too have used our faith to persecute and condemn people we don't like, just like Saul did. Whether we personally need to hear these hard truths from Jesus or not, we've got to face the hard truth that Christians have used God to make a profit and to justify their hatred. And that's given us all a bad name. But remember, Jesus makes a way forward. For Saul, he offered a new life, a new name, a new purpose. But the way forward that Jesus was offering was through darkness and prayer and fasting. For the Jewish temple leaders, Jesus suggests that the way forward is first through destruction. Letting go of what is, what's familiar, and giving your life over to God being one with Christ that you might be resurrected with him also. As our founder, John Wesley, suggests, to be 
of the same mind as was in Christ, to be one with Jesus, you must spend time with him in prayer and open yourself up to his spirit. Prayer is the most effective way I know to hear and heed Christ's guidance. Now, it's not that we don't pray as a church, but I suspect we work a lot more than we pray. We pray before our church meetings, but how many times do we meet just to pray? How many times has the church council spent its whole meeting time praying? How many committees ever meet just to pray? What could God do through us if we spent half of our meeting times in prayer? I'm starting to get a little nervous just saying these words. <laughs> I can feel myself tensing up, and I have to wonder, why does spending time with God in prayer sound so crazy? I mean, what would it get done if we prayed more? Well, we might not make a profit. Our agendas might not get pushed aside. But what could God get done through us if we prayed more? In the book we're reading, the author Martha Grace Reese tells about a church that tried prayer as their meetings, rather than just for 30 seconds before the meeting. There were three high-energy, can-do women in this church that were going to start their evangelism team at the Benton Street Church. They were fired up to do great things for God that year. And so they brought Reese in as a consultant for some direction of what they could do first. A calling campaign, or bring a friend to church Sunday, maybe direct mail marketing. No, the consultant said, not that. Not yet. She told them to pray for three months before they did a single thing. The evangelism committee at Benton Street was looking for activity. They were looking for work to do. They wanted to be active and moving. But instead, Reese told them to stand still and to pray. To wait in prayer for three months. Now, prayer is a different kind of hard work, of course. Most of us don't even know how to do it for very long anyway. But this evangelism, evangelism committee put their can-do attitude to work, and they learned how to pray. They prayed together for one hour every week. For three months, they met every week and sat and prayed for an hour. At board meetings, when it was their turn to report on what was going on, they'd say, we're still praying. She's making us do it. We're just praying. And everybody would laugh and chuckle, but then board members would start giving them prayer requests. And after three months of doing nothing but just praying, interest in evangelism at their church skyrocketed. By the end of the year, 65 people were helping with the evangelism team. New visitors were coming in droves. Twice as many people were received into membership that year than the year before, and twice as many baptisms were done. Sounds a bit like Paul, Saul's incredible transformation into Paul. Paul, who was murdering Christians and then who went on to go spread the good news to Christ, of Christ to hundreds of thousands of people. And whose letters make up half of our New Testament. Apparently facing the truth Christ brings and seeking his guidance through 
your prayer makes a difference. Prayer allows us to express our willingness to do what Jesus wants us to do. Prayer prepares us to be effective in whatever work we do for God. Prayer helps us make room for the Holy Spirit in our lives. It helps us hold open a window for the Spirit to come in, and it helps us wait there for direction. So can we try it? What have we got to lose? Some of you already have prayer built into your daily lives, I know, but many of us don't. No matter how often you pray, we can all grow in our prayer life, and so can our church. So for the next month, how about we pray as a church like we've never prayed before? Will you pray with us for the next month? Just one month. You're already using the 40 days of prayer, the prayer <coughs> journal, if you're in one of our small groups. And if you're not, join one. If you need a copy of the book, let me know. We'll get you one. But to start this month off right, we're going to pray right now as a congregation. Right in the middle of a sermon. It's crazy, I know, but we have to put our money where our mouth is. Because this is probably the hardest truth of them all, isn't it? We talk a good game, but we've got to actually start doing it. If you've been praying with us for this past couple weeks, this is going to be easy. So first I want you to get comfortable. Relax your muscles. But somehow, hold one or both of your hands upward in your lap, on your legs. I'm going to explain what we're going to do and then we're going to pray together. So we're going to sit quietly, breathe slowly, and ask God what to pray for. This is really important because a lot of us go into prayer with our own agendas. So this time we're going to ask God who or what to pray for. And then whoever God tells you, I want you to imagine that they shrink down to the size where they would fit in your hands. And then I want you to hold them there and pray for them. And then we'll hear a tone and I'll say amen and we'll be done. All right? Everyone ready? Let us pray.
year. <laughs> Thank you for your willingness. This is more important than maybe any of us could really know, that we go to pray together. And you know, a lot of us know we should be praying more. But we don't. We think we don't have the time or there's more important <coughs> things to be done. I want, I want you to really understand how ridiculous that sounds. If we really stop and think about it, something more important than spending time with God, our Creator, there is nothing more important than that. We foolishly believe that we've got to get everything done before we can have the luxury of prayer. So let us hear this hard truth and admit to ourselves that we've been doing it backwards for far too long. And let's commit now together to turn it around. I am giving you permission to pray first. Let's be less responsible to the world and more responsive to God. I don't mind if all the stuff doesn't get done during this month. Who cares if there's some snow on the sidewalks? And you know, I really don't think God cares either. Little things can slide as long as you're spending that time praying instead. Let's agree among ourselves that we're going to make prayer a priority for four more weeks. And then we'll just see. We'll just see what God has done with us and through us. I believe God will do some amazing things with us during this time. I'm already seeing it. I don't know what they'll be. Maybe new visitors or a new sense of unity. Maybe new ideas or increased giving. Most likely, it's going to be something none of us could even imagine. But I believe, I know that making room for prayer will bring new blessings. So in this next month, let's leave some work and pray. Let's pray like we've never prayed before, and let's make prayer our work. Let's face the truth and give up our addiction to busyness. Let's start with prayer first and turn over our church to God. Let's wait for four weeks. Let's wait for the blessings to arrive. Just wait for that to come in the window that we're holding open through prayer. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's stand and sing. <laughs>